Ready, Tom? We are um, in Beach Island, Aiken County, South Carolina, right near Augusta, Georgia. For some of our new people, I think we have a big crowd today. We want you all to understand what we're going to do is look at the seeds for fall vegetables that we planted about three or four weeks ago. So a lot of people who were in the group watched us do that planting. Today we're going to look at how to transition those and to make sure that you're getting those potted up to make sure you have success once you have those things germinated. We're also going to look a little bit at seed saving because it's the time of year. I'm going to lean over and join, grab something right here. It's the time of year that, you know, a simple little few minutes saving some peas for next year will save you three dollars for next summer um, but there's some real simple techniques and I know when I say three dollars for some people that doesn't sound like a lot but if you think about all the different seeds that you're going to grow next summer it does become a lot and there are other reasons to do that too we're also going to end up today with a little reading and I picked a reading that's about the history of our soil and the soil problems in the South. Okay, we're gonna get started with my mom. This is Gloria Farmer. Good morning. These are turnips. We plant, we sowed the seed about three weeks ago, maybe a little bit, um, maybe a little bit longer, but they, uh, they germinated real good. We then went back and thinned them and when we thinned them, we just kept those little greens and, and ate them. They were real tender and real good. These are red turnips, which we've never planted before. I, um, I, I've never seen them before, so it's going to be kind of interesting to see what happens with them. But we've kept them weeded and watered when we needed to. And um, they they they're just doing real good different turnip down here it, it's a regular um purple top turnip and it's also done very good you can really see a difference in the the leaves that the the red these red ones have grown um just a look they're a little bit bigger leaf and they've grown a little bit faster can i jump in real quick mama said you can see a different in the leaf what I see is that the purple top is hairy. I don't know how much you can see that, but it's covered with hairs. And I think that's one reason some people don't like it. But when you cook it, those hairs go away. Oh, yeah. But this red turnip is absolutely smooth. Okay. What else we were going to look at? Do we want to move? move? Oh, wait a minute. No, you had a failure right here. Did you? Oh, you, no, I didn't. We planted... Um, cilantro a row right here and for some reason it did not germinate so we're gonna have to replant it and that just that just happens sometimes but um one thing y'all you, you i don't know if you know this because I, I mean we're not going out mama hadn't been out to grocery stores in um four months but places like box stores and even little grocery stores that would sometimes have racks of seed they don't have any seeds this year you almost have to get your seed from um, mail order. Um, I've heard that there are a couple of places carrying seeds that are local and we have a place called Country Boy that has lots of seeds but an easy place to get some seeds is from the grocery store. So we had this failure of cilantro so I just went to the spice section yesterday and I got um, some organically grown coriander seeds and you know coriander and cilantro are the same plant. So we're gonna plant these from the grocery store. You can get fennel, parsley seed. Uh, what else? We made a list yesterday. Garlic. Garlic, which isn't a seed, but no. um, mustard. You can get mustard seed in the little spice section. And then the other thing you wanted us to see, Mama, was this which looks like something from the 18th century, but a lot of modern gardeners use this tool. And I don't know how long we've had this, do you, Mo? Probably 40 years. So it's a real simple tool. 
all it does is makes a straight road. You could use it, right, to till if you wanted to, but it's not really intended for that. It just gives us a really straight row. And then if you back yourself up after you seed, that wheel also presses the seed in so you get good soil contact. And then you just put as much, whatever depth you want um, to cover it. You didn't sow the zinnias, right? No, we had a big little patch of zinnias here that was so pretty. And they just got real tall and laid over and ha half dying. So these have just volunteered up. And they're going to have to be thin, but they have plenty of time to bloom between now and frost. So we have one more thing that we're going to look at in the vegetable garden. No, two more things. One is a good example of why it's so important to be around, and we're, we're lucky that we're around a lot this year to do this. Yesterday, Mama pointed out that we had all this um, damage on the turnip leaves, and I came down, I just knelt down, I put my fingers in, and I looked and I found a lot of frass, and if you don't know what frass is, I posted a video of this in the group. Video. I found the little caterpillar who was causing this damage. Y'all, that it was a tiny little thing. He would have eaten this whole row of cabbage down in a week. Turnips, turnips, sorry, turnips. And the other thing we want to look at before we go um, to our little nursery area is this temporary shade structure. We've been so dry and so hot for the past few weeks. Um, I just looked around in the barns and I found this this old mat reed um, reed fencing or wattle fencing, and we made a little shade structure and now we have beets started under here. We planted them on Monday and you can see right here that they are up. You got them, Tom. Yeah. So the beets are up here. These are actually golden beets, which I like a lot. let's start with let's start with a big failure I caused a huge problem and I killed our entire community pot of cabbage by over fertilizing so what um what I do for fertilizer is have just a little hand can and I use an organic fertilizer. Right now I'm using this fish fertilizer, which is really not the best thing because it's a little too high in nitrogen. There's, I want to make sure everybody understands the numbers on fertilizer. So basically you can remember this little um, mnemonic. Um, shoots, roots, and fruits. That's what the numbers mean. Leaves, root growth, and body and cellular growth and the last number is what you would use to produce lots of flowers and therefore fruits. So right now what we want is definitely a number in the middle that's equal to the number here. Um, but this is what I have, so this is what I've been using. So I do a tiny drop of this. I mix it really, really, really weak. Well, actually, I can't do it right now, and I don't want to get uh, smelly. This stuff is disgusting. Um, so I do a tiny drop of this, and then I'll just do a little hand fertilizer every other day or so on our seedlings. Well, when I mixed one day, I went way too high on my rate, and then it got really hot that day, and every friggin' cabbage we had died. So we had to start over. Again, good reminder of why to do all of this now while it's still warm, while you have time to fix your mistakes. Um, so we have cabbage coming up in our community pot here. We have parsley 
coming up. Tom, do you want me to move these or are you moving? I can just leave them. This is our parsley coming up like cilantro. It'll be growing over the winter. Y'all, I have planted parsley in little blocks like that in January when the blocks were frozen solid as ice cubes and it thrives. We have a um, community pot here of our red mustard. So if you got our seed pack, you got our red mustard. We also have um, our transfers of kale. Okay, I want to show you a little trick. And Eric from Riverbanks told me this, that most people plant things too high out the ground. Well, I did exactly that, Eric. So what I'm going to do is remedy that simply by adding soil to the top. Now, if you were growing like Eric or Andy Cave at Riverbanks, if you were growing 10,000 of these, it wouldn't work. You might be overwhelmed, but it's easy enough in these little cases to do that. Um, I'm going to go through our seed pack real quick. So this is um, posted in our group. And again, I want to remind you, it's hard to get seed this year, but we did a little pre-selection for you. Um, we have six different seeds that come in our pack. Red kale, purple mustard, um, a loose leaf lettuce, purple top turnips, and um, Bob did a fun little trick and added a couple of red turnips in there. Mizuno, which is also a mustard, and arugula. Arugula comes up like that. I mean, four days this time of year. Okay, so in addition to that, we are growing um, a lot of these things in the ground. We have a 75-foot row of the red Russian kale. We have a few Swiss chard. You know, a lot of these things like Swiss chard are incredibly productive. Um, we had last year probably four, four, maybe six Swiss chard plants, and, and it was awesome. We just had the last bit of it for, that we froze last week. Um, some of the other things we've done, um, broccoli. My mom loves broccoli. And we've done some community pots of zinnia. Um, okay, let, let, since we stopped, let's stop here. I think that's about all we have to look at. Um, okay, so we're using this. Um, I can't say that I recommend one brand more than the other. Just use whichever one you can get. Um, local stores will have a seed mix. I think the key is that you want a seed starting mix to get started with, okay? Not just regular potting soil. I've made that mistake over and over. And not old dirt or old potting soil. Um, honestly, I'll use that kind of stuff sometimes for moving things up, but especially with seed starting, when you take old potting soil, you're very likely to bring weeds in and you're likely to bring cutworms. So we're gonna look at what to do about cutworms. So Tom, look, can you see into this? So a, a real common problem with making these kind of transfers, and this is true in the ground and in these small community pots, is that you'll see your little seedlings cut off like that. I'm going to pull that one up so y'all can see it more clearly. What can I put it against? Look at that. It is just literally like a tree has been chopped off. If you see that, the right away you know that you have cutworms. So cutworms are little caterpillars. They're some kind of little moth caterpillar. If you have them in little community pots, or if you have them in little pots like this, the easiest way to get rid of a cutworm is to submerge that pot. And I was hoping this worm would come up. I went ahead and submerged it, hoping to get him out of there. But he hadn't shown up yet. So he can't stand that, um, being, he can't stand drowning, right? And normally they'll just pop right up. I don't know where this one's going to. But that's a really easy way to deal with cutworms. If you have 
a caterpillar problem and most of our problems this time of year are caterpillar problems and you cannot find it then you need to go with BT okay we talked about BT when we were getting ready for all this Thuricide is a brand name BT oh, wait. Um, okay back to BT BT is Bacillus thuringiensis it's an old long-standing long-tested tried and true organic caterpillar control so it's actually a dehydrated bacteria and it's sold either in powder form or in these liquid forms and when you spray it on you spray it on the leaf get a good coating on the leaf and when that little guy comes along see it's telling him luckily this little caterpillar can't read he ingests that bacteria he's susceptible to that bacteria as susceptible as we are to terrible viruses and it causes him to have lockjaw his mouth literally locks open and he can't eat anymore and you'll find him almost frozen in place so BT is the only chemical that we use um, and if I could not like in the row out in the garden if I could not have found that caterpillar yesterday I would have taken a little hand spray bottle of BT and coated that whole area okay we do have one more question Tom how do we decide what to grow in directly in the ground and what to start in the seed mix really it's from experience but if you're talking about seeds in our pack um, everything in this pack can be direct sown in the ground um, arugula mustard kale is easy all mizunas mustards lettuce is really easy normally cilantro is easy I'll tell you one thing one rule that I use is anything that you're growing for a root vegetable such as a turnip a carrot a radish uh, what else would you be doing this time of year for roots beets yeah all of those things put them directly in the ground because you try to transfer that little beet that little beet and you're gonna get this weirdo contorted beet so I do all of those things in the ground some of the things that I think are a little more difficult are Swiss chard so we do Swiss chard in community pots um, broccoli we do in community pots and parsley we did our parsley in a community pot not because it's difficult in the ground but because the places that we want to put it are scattered out all through the garden so we plant bar parsley not only for us but we plant it for pollinators and we want to plant it all around so it's too hard to take care of one little parsley seed coming up in the middle of some zinnias and one little parsley seed coming up in the crinum field we're talking about seed collecting we talked about beans look at these most the most beautiful beans hyacinth beans thank you Linda Christine for this big bag of hyacinth beans um, my mom has been doing marigolds okay so all she's done is laid them out and she's letting them dry and there's all this like extra stuff there and oh, you know over the winter that stuff will just kind of fall away and you'll end up in the end with a bunch of marigold seeds down in the bottom um, we'll just put these in paper bags or coffee bags are awesome for this we've done the same thing with zinnia seeds if you are really meticulous like my old buddy Eric was and he introduced me to these actually it was probably um, the meticulous mr. Bob Waits who got these for me and Eric years ago look at these beautiful little things I have no idea what they are made for but this when I used to have time is how I would store my seeds do you have any idea anybody know what these are made for like little no. salves like you could put little if you were making salves or lip balm or something or maybe I don't know jewelry but look how look how good I used to be I would write down little names 
and look how I am now. This is my seed box now. Um, some people want to know about what, Tom? Crinum and fennel. Oh, crinum and fennel. You know, we grow fennel, again, for pollinators. We have big, a big mass of fennel. It's time to sow fennel seeds right now. Winter grower, you can buy it at the grocery store. Um, fennel in this state is really good for digestion. Our friend Malika was telling us this the other day. So every time I walk by this, I eat this, and sometimes if I'm not looking closely, I mistakenly eat one of those little caterpillars, so we have one less butterfly. Um, we do have a good many crinums in flower. We had pink trumpet, which is a real tall one we looked at last week. We have rose parade in flower. And a lot of the digweedy eyes, and the digweedy eyes, it's an awesome story about this um, guy named Mr. Digweed, believe it or not, a horticulturalist who developed them and um, been really fun. I did some history writing on him and his grandsons have been in contact with me. One of them is American and one of them is still a, runs a really beautiful garden design business in the UK. Y'all, I'm going to um, stop with this and do a little reading and if you don't mind a little history lesson myself um, when I started writing this book my mentor Bennett Baxley who's featured in the book said um, if you're gonna write about me then you're also gonna have to come down once a month sit with me interview me and let me give you some big lessons and the big lesson that he came up with is that he felt like I had to know about the soil catastrophe that happened right here in South Carolina. The reason I chose to read this is that lots of what we're doing is today lots of growing these seeds and growing these veggies is really hard for some people who have red hard clay and bad soil it's important for us to look back and make sure we never do this again. The reason we, the young people today, are fighting with this red bad soil is that our forefathers messed it up. Um, in this chapter, I want to introduce you to one of my mentors, Yves Rose, Yves Rose Valdez. I hope you're watching Yves Rose. Um, Yves Rose grew up in Haiti, which is somewhere else that has had terrible soil catastrophes. Luckily, we've um, spent the last 80 years or so trying to fix ours, but I thought y'all would like to hear a little bit about it. So this is called the Soil Catastrophe of the South. While most of the U.S. felt the Depression in 1929, it started nine years earlier in South Carolina with the crash of cotton. Many economic reasons combined to cause that crash, but one of the problems with cotton is that the plant simply takes a lot out of the soil. The common practice was to clear a new field, to grow cotton for a couple of years, and then move on, leaving that field depleted. This created an abundance of empty fields that just sat around and eroded into our rivers. The soil catastrophe began a few years before the Dust Bowls. Both of these today are considered among the largest human-made environmental disasters the world has ever known. And both had similar causes. Poor land management, poor understanding of science, and quite simply, greed. While this happened in Georgia, all the way up into Virginia, it was most widespread in the Carolinas. It led to massive migration. The 1850 federal census showed that more than half of the population of Alabama had actually been born in South Carolina. And they were moving there because it was so stark and so poor and so hard to get good nutrients in South Carolina. By 1920, eight million of the 19 million farm acres in South Carolina was declared destroyed. My father spent his whole life repairing that. 
that whole generation of post-World War II people spent their whole life repairing that. And we are really lucky to have had a good soil base here and to work on it. But I want you to remember those kind of things. When you're struggling with that heavy red clay, that's not your soil. That's your subsoil. Your goal is to create something that is like a topsoil on top of that. And this kind of growing is a great hobby that we're happy to share from our farms. And we're happy to... Um, have y'all join us. We will see you next Saturday morning. Unless there's any big question that I should address before we hang up. Hang up.